Well, good morning, church family. It's so good that we can gather together. I, I realize we're still apart and in totally different places, and hopefully one day soon we'll be able to gather here in the room. But whether you're watching um, on Facebook Live or on YouTube or on Vimeo, thank you from, from us here um, in the building to wherever you are for choosing to worship with us today. And again, um, there are folks manning the chat room. So if you, if you want to reach out and say hi, either in any of those platforms, they will respond. If you have any questions, we can get in, you know, you can answer back and forth with them. We can even get in touch with you privately um, away from that chat room if you have any questions about what's going on and about being introduced to who God is. But as we begin this morning, before we sing together, we have a special announcement from our deacons and from our pastor search team. So I'm going to turn things over to Mickey Barger, chairman of our deacons. Good morning, everybody, and also happy Mother's Day. Last Wednesday, the Deacon Council met to consider when we should gather again face to face. As well as you know, we would need to also vote on our senior pastor. After powerful consideration, the deacons decided the best bet was to follow Governor Lee's guidelines for houses of worship, and we should continue to meet online until the month through the month of May. We want to meet together again. Hopefully in a few weeks, the situation will have changed enough so that we could meet together again. Please continue to pray for us as we consider a timeline for returning to the church building. The senior pastor search team, most whom are standing behind me, have presented John Hunn as a candidate for senior pastor. We have been able to hear him every week since March the 15th. The church had an opportunity to meet him on March the 14th, which was a Saturday. The call schedule had to be put on hold because of the pandemic. With that said, our church is in a unique situation. We are continuing to figure out a way to call the senior pastor. As a result of the unprecedented restrictions caused by the COVID-19 virus, the deacons have agreed for a one-time change in the voting process for senior pastor. This action only alters the way the votes are cast. All other guidelines and requirements will remain the same. And here's the details. A churchwide vote for senior pastor will begin this afternoon, May the 10th, and will, the opportunity to vote will continue through Saturday, May the 23rd at 12 p.m. noon. Church members may vote in two ways. First one, you may vote online, a digital link will be emailed and posted on our website and social media throughout this link. Church members will be able to cast their vote. Number two, telephone. Church members may also call church office during regular hours to cast their vote. The personnel team, stewardship team, and deacons met on Saturday, March the 15th and approved senior pastor job descriptions and compensation. If you'd like details on these, please come by the church office during office hours and we'll be glad to give you a copy to review. The chairpersons for these teams are Keith Schrader, personnel, Lloyd Quillen, stewardship, and myself, Mickey Barger, chairman of the deacons. We are all available by phone if you have any questions. A churchwide email will be sent out this afternoon with all the information and voting link included. The link to vote will be posted on the website and made available to the social media as well as other things this afternoon. Church members that do not have email will receive the information through the regular snail mail process. We realize how different this voting method is and pray that you will see the wisdom of the change because of the unprecedented situation. Please feel free to call me or any of our deacons if you have any questions. Now let us pray. Father, thank you for the goodness and mercy Though we don't understand what is happening in this world around us, we do understand that you are Lord of all. Thank you for your continued guidance as we seek your will in calling a senior pastor here at First Baptist Church. Thank you for the search team and their continued prayerful service in seeking out whom you are calling. Thank you for our deacons and their willingness to serve the congregation. Also, thank you for bringing Pastor John Hunt to us as a candidate for senior pastor. Continue to lead our church as we enter this voting process. May your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Thank you, Mickey, and thank you, search team. Uh, church, let's give our attention to God. As we have gathered in this scattered, unique way to proclaim that God is with us. No matter where we are, our hearts can be gathered together. So we shout the good news that Jesus is risen and he resides in the praises of his people. So wherever you're at, let's join our voices and our hearts together and give him praise. singing a prayer, recognizing we need the presence of God in our life and every single part of it as individuals and as a church. So let's proclaim this together from wherever you're at. Lord, I need you. Lord, I come. I confess. Now we
temptation comes my way. When I cannot stand, I'll follow you. Jesus, you're my hope and sin. Good morning, church, on Mother's Day. I was thinking early this morning what a great church we have. We may not have been able to meet together here in the worship center for the last some eight weeks, but it's interesting when you're here at times during the day and you see moms and dads and grandparents driving by, sticking their offering envelope in the box. And you see how faithful, sometimes the sun is shining, sometimes it's raining. Or you see Tanya in the office and as people are bringing their tithe envelopes, just faithful to God. Now I got thinking when I see all these different families, even though we may not be here, we're still together. And what a great church we have. Thank you for your faithfulness. Here we are several weeks into this, and yet our budget remains strong, all because of you. I was thinking about all the different mothers, especially my own mother today. I turn to Proverbs chapter 31. I wanna read one verse. Charm is deceitful, beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. The strength of our mothers are really those that fear the Lord and guide us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Will you pray with me? Lord, help us to be mindful of the grace that drew us to you. 
for the blood, your blood that cleanses us, for your righteousness that justifies us, and the truth that sanctifies us. Oh, dear Lord, control us completely that today we may live for your glory. And that, Lord, we love you with all of our hearts. Strengthen us from your word today is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
Wow, wow, wow. Thank you for that great music. It's great to be here to hear singers and the orchestra. Can't wait till you guys can all come here and, and uh, shake this place to the heavens. It's going to be great. But in the meantime, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy. I have a new series, Vital Signs of a Healthy Church. We want to continue to talk about foundations, making sure that all we do is built on solid ground. The heartbeat of a healthy church, or what we're going to talk about for several weeks, maybe even two months, starting with the Word of God and getting to the God of the Word. But we start with the Word of God because it is the key to everything we know. Everything we know about God and everything we know about life, everything we know about ourselves comes from the Word of God. It is our source, it is sufficient, it is perfect, it is inerrant, it is holy. There's no book like it, and much of our study might be a reminder to you, but I, I, I know few Christians, as I've talked to them over the years, have heard a condensed version of what the Bible says about itself. The goal of this series is that all of us may have great confidence in the incredible claims of Scripture. Now, this material is also very good for evangelism. As we are sharing our faith, we can tell the unbelieving world, are you aware of what the Bible claims to be? So many unbelievers, and I was one of them, uh, had pretty strong convictions about the Bible, though I'd never read it. So this is going to be great for the believer to make sure that all we do, all we think, all we're about, our motives, our actions, everything is based on Scripture and we can share this with our friends and make sure they understand what the Word of God is to us. Two words come to mind that I'll repeat probably for the first four parts, and that is the word supernatural and transformational. The Bible claims to be from God, that God gave us this book. It claims it in the Old Testament, claims it in the New Testament, Peter, Paul, and even Jesus claims that the Bible is supernatural in its origin, but we can't stop there because the goal of this supernatural scripture is to change us. It's personally transformational. It has power, and you'll learn this in the next few weeks, and I'm, I'm very, very excited to share this with you. By way of one last point of introduction, I wanna share a sort of a theme that, that I use to train pastors, and I have used it since 2002. It's a, uh, from Leadership Resources International, a wonderful missions agency from Chicago, and it's called Stay on the Line. We, we teach the pastors there to trust the Word of God. And by the way, this isn't just good for foreign pastors, it's good for Christians in every land. All of us need to make sure, if you wanna know what God is saying, and if you're gonna teach it for sure, Sunday school teachers and preachers and et cetera, stay on the line of God's word. Stay on the line. We call the line the word of God. Stay in the word. We don't need to spend tons of time looking for great illustrations. We need to spend most of our time in the Bible. And, and there are incredible illustrations that will come from that. Here's what we say to the pastors and I say to you today, don't go above the line. Don't add to God's word. Don't say more than the Bible is saying. God doesn't need my help. He doesn't need your help. We can commentary on the word, but the word is sufficient and strong and powerful all alone. Trust it. Legalism adds to God's word and we need to be weary of legalism. The second point is don't go below the line. Don't take away from God's word. That is what we would call, I would call liberalism. Don't, don't say something's missing, I need to add to God's truth, uh, uh, or that shouldn't be there, I'm gonna take away. If you will trust God's word, then you will enjoy the benefits, the transformational power of the word of God. In a minute, we're gonna be in Deuteronomy 6, but I wanna give you three scriptures that affirm the stay on the line principle. One is in the book of Deuteronomy. One is in the book of Proverbs and one, the last book of Revelation. 
So Moses, who wrote the first five books of the Bible, Solomon, who was the author, the human author of Proverbs, and John, the disciple uh, who wrote Revelation, all agree with this principle. Let me read these verses to you. Deuteronomy 4, 1 and 2. And now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the rules that I am teaching you, and do them that you may live that you may go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. Just do what I say is the word of God. Has any parent ever said that to their children? Any teacher ever said that to a student? Just do do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. Strong words. And now the end, the middle, the beginning, and now the end. Revelation 22, 18 and 19. John says, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. That is serious, folks. There are plagues in the book of Revelation unlike any plague in all the Bible. This is God's serious warning. Don't touch my word. You start touching it, and before you know it, you're preaching something else. If anyone takes away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. You can't miss it. The beginning of the Bible, the middle of the Bible, and the end affirms this principle. Trust the word of God. Don't mess with it. We will see in the weeks to come that King David has this same view. The major prophets, the minor prophets, Peter and Paul have incredible statements about the word of God. And I want to highlight one that I'll quote in a few weeks. And it's from Matthew four, where Jesus is being tempted, 40 days tempted, three temptations and three times he fights off temptation with scripture which is an illustration and an example for us. If you want to resist temptation, Jesus says, fight Satan, fight uh, temptation with the word of God. And by the way, all three times he's quoting the book of Deuteronomy. Now he could have spoken any word into existence and it would, it would have been the word of God. So Jesus is telling us the Old Testament is not a dead testament. Here's what he said after the first temptation of you haven't eaten. Jesus turned the bread into turned the stone into bread. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus said and believed that the Bible comes from the mouth of God. It's supernatural in origin. Therefore, it is transformational in power. Today, I want to remind all of the parents out there, and that is not just mothers and not just fathers, but grandparents of your high calling. This is Mother's Day, and it's a reminder that the greatest influence, according to the word of God, the greatest influence in the world today is found in the home. It is the home that shapes countries, cities, it is the home and the family that, that decides what a nation and country and city will be like. It is not pastors. Pastors have a role. Principals have a role in the schools. Presidents have a role, especially in our country, of course. But nobody has more influence and nobody ha has more responsibility. Nobody has a higher privilege than parents. We've got to make sure that First Baptist Lenore City, that we empower you, that we equip you, and that we encourage you and come alongside you and help you disciple your families. Because as the family goes, so goes the church, and so goes the nation. And I want to say something because even though my mother was married six times in 16 years, which is a startling statement, honestly. Believe it or not, I felt like I lived, uh, grew up in a single family home. <laughs> that sounds crazy. How could that be true? But, but it is very much so. But I don't think you have to grow up in a single parent home. And by the way, there are men raising their kids as well. When I say single parent, I don't mean just ladies. 
there are some men doing that. And I just want to say this as a challenge to everyone out there. And that is our single parents need extra attention. They need extra attention of the church. They need to make sure we come alongside them. And, and it's not that they're more important, they're more needy. And so we've got to make sure that we know who they are and that we can meet those needs. One, one last thing I'm, I'm going to say um, is um, that Sunday school as a ministry started in England. And very few people know this. Uh, I remember when I was told this a couple years ago, I, I, I couldn't believe it. And I went back and checked it. It's true. Sunday school, the ministry of Sunday school started in England for orphans. It started for kids who didn't have parents because there was an assumption, a strong assumption that parents would be teaching their children about theology and about God and about the Bible. And from that, it grew into what it is today. I'm not against Sunday school, but Sunday school is not a replacement for the role of parents. If we lose our homes, we lose our country. And I think you can tell why our country has gone down the last 50 years based on my introduction here. But because of our great God, because of his power, because of his grace, because of all the wonderful things that he's done, there is still hope for us. And there are seven principles in Deuteronomy 6 that I believe we can follow today and get our country back on track and, and reestablish the foundation that God gave Israel. When you open to Deuteronomy 6, what you are finding is that 40 years have passed since Israel has wandered in the wilderness. 40 years have passed from Exodus, from them not going into the promised land. Clearly God showed his power. Clearly God showed his purpose. There were no reason, no good reason they shouldn't go in, but they didn't go in. Fear. And God punished them 40 years of wandering. And in Deuteronomy 5, one chapter before this, God repeats the Ten Commandments. That's very important. Chapter six, they're getting ready to enter into the promised land. So the 10 commandments have been repeated. God hasn't changed. Love me, love your neighbor, love mankind. This is still the most important things. It's always going to be the most important things. Now learn and go in the right way. It's been a hard, long 40 years, a punishing 40 years. But God in his grace is giving them a second chance. I want you to first see from the first two verses, the Lord's purpose. The Lord's purpose was and is for successive generations to be faithful. I want you to hear that. For successive generations to be faithful. From babies to senior adults. All of us. Look at the first two verses. Now this is the commandment Moses said under the inspiration of the Lord. This is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God. Now, let me just stop there and just say, the reason God wants us to fear him is so that we won't fear anything else. If you don't fear God, you will have many fears. But if you have a strong fear of God, a strong, healthy, holy fear of God, nothing will shake you. I promise you that. That you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son. God is interested in more than just one generation. Much can be done in one generation, but hear me out, church. Much can be lost in one generation as well. By keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life that, and, and that your days may be long. The, the Lord's purpose is faithfulness in all generations to continue all that he began to do. Don't forget, just to give you an idea of how devastating the fall was at one time. Now, this is a little bit silly, maybe, but at one time, everybody knew the Lord. Everybody named Adam and Eve. Everybody knew the Lord. It didn't start with chaos. It didn't start with confusion. Everybody knew the Lord. And then they had children. They all knew the Lord. And then when Noah started over, they all knew who the Lord was. We are in the shape we are today because we haven't been faithful in successive generations. 
And it's cost us. And I'm so thankful that the Lord, that his promises are true. Look at verse three. Let's talk about the Lord's promise. Make every word count here as I read. Hear, therefore. Hear. Let's be good listeners to God. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them. The opposite of carefulness is carelessness. Be careful. Be very careful to obey them that it may go well with you and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in the land flowing with milk and honey. A land that will be fruitful. A land that produces on its own without your help. That's one of the definitions of milk and honey. If you've ever been to Israel, and I hope that you have, I only got to go one time in 1997. It's I've been all over the world. I've been, I think, on five continents, maybe four. I've seen incredible things from the beauty of Istanbul to the mountains of Quito, Ecuador. I mean, I have so many things I could talk about. The Great Wall of China, but there is nothing in the world like Israel to me. Nothing. It just, you feel the presence of Jesus in that place. It's powerful. They've tried to shrine it. They've tried to ruin it. They've bombed it. But it's... It's unlike any other place. Having said that, if you ask me about the topography, I would tell you this. It's dust and rock. What else is there? More dust and more rock. And yet this dusty, rocky land, God calls a land flowing with milk and honey. Don't base your life on what you see. You're going to see dust and rock. That's all you see. But God sees more than you see. God sees more than Israel saw. And that land, if you go there now, you will buy oranges that look like grapefruits, grapefruits that look like small basketballs, watermelons that look like state fair blue ribbon champions. It is a fertile land that can only be explained by God. It's rock and dust. That's it. That's all you see. The Lord's purpose is that we are faithful in all generations. His promise is that we are careful, and if we are careful in our obedience, God promises blessing. 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 Does that mean a new camel? Does that mean a new car? Anybody want a new camel? I don't know where that came from. That wasn't in my notes. A new camel back then? A brand new camel? A brand? No, that's God's blessings often are spiritual. I've said to you before, the things that matter most are the things you can't buy. They have to come from God. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. The the gifts of the fruits of the Spirit. There are no stores like that anywhere in Loudoun County, state of Tennessee, the United States, or the world. Those are the blessings that I want. I have been to the poorest nations in the world, and I've seen some of the wealthiest nations in the world. I've been to Dubai, and I've been to Guatemala and Honduras. And I can tell you that that happiness that that I saw was in Central America, not in the Middle East. God wants to bless us. He wants to, and he does bless us, but he says, be careful, be careful in your obedience. Look at the third point, the Lord's power. What makes us be able to trust his purpose and his power, his promises? How do we do that? It's because he's so powerful. Verse four is, is the great Shema. It's pronounced a little different, but every, every Israelite, every Hebrew, every Jew will, would know the word Shema. It was the great uh, theme of the household of every Hebrew person, probably still is today. I don't know if they would follow it, but we need to follow it because it's the beginning of the first great commandment. Hear, O Israel. Verse 3 started with hear as well. Hear, therefore, Israel, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, there's a little bit of controversy in this passage, a little bit even among Bible-believing scholars that I trust very much. Is he he one in his being or, uh, or or, or is he one and the only one? And the answer is yes. He's one in essence, but he's also the only God. And we're going to study this in the second part of the vital 
signs. There are no other gods. There's only one, one sovereign God. You can't have two sovereigns. He's the only God. Isaiah says it more than anybody because he's trying to get people back to this God. We have a God that we can trust because he has no rivals. He has no rivals. He, he can follow through with his promises. He can make his purposes happen. And we'll see this in the history of Israel. When they disobey, God himself raises up uh, the foreign countries around him. God gives them victory. And then he shows them that the victory was his, not theirs. This is so politically incorrect, but so theologically critical. Our God is one God and he is the only God that's ever existed. The truth might rattle a few cages, folks, but the truth is also the means by which God sets us, what? Free. Tell the truth, speak the truth in love, in love, in love, in love. The fourth point is the Lord requires passion. We have to listen, we have to be careful, but he requires passion, verse five, you shall love the Lord your God. Love him, love him. And by the way, I always wanna say when I hear a verse like this, the real key to our relationship to God is that we would love him back, right? First John four nineteen. we love God because he first loved us. God loved us, that's why he created us. He created us because he loved us. He sent Jesus Christ. God so loved the world. Love has been the motivating factor in creation and redemption. And it's the, it's the right factor in our discipleship. It's the right factor in our evangelism. Why would you risk losing your friendly neighbor over the gospel? Because you love God. That's it. I love God and therefore I'm going to obey the God I love and share the gospel with my neighbor and hope that we can still be friends. And usually you can, but not always, I can tell you. You shall love the Lord your God. And he doesn't stop there, it's wonderful. With all your heart, in all your soul, with all your might, give me all you have. Love me with your entire being. Now Hallmark has a card for about everything. And by the way, on Mother's Day, always cracks me up, the biggest card day in the history of the world. And the second one, Father's, is not Father's Day. We're like sixth or seventh on the list, just for the record, okay? And I always like to say, I, you know, my kids played sports, and, and I've, I've heard this before, and I, I've always been committed since I've been a believer to the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, but it's always been interesting to me that when the camera pans the benches, whether it's a college football game or college basketball game or a pro, it's panning it quick. And those big, strong athletes, they, they don't have much time, but they, the, little, the little time they have, what do they say? Hi, mom. I'm like, what about me? I, I threw the football, mom throws like this. I was throwing like right. And, and I, hours I spent in the, hi, mom. That's the role that moms play. That's the beauty of the womb that God would give moms. That's the beauty. I've had some uh, ladies that have adopted children that said, Pastor, I've heard you talk about the womb, but I can tell you that uh, that baby wasn't in my womb. But there, I have that same motherly instinct you've talked about, and I don't doubt that one bit. Love. Love. Love is so important, but you're never going to see a Hallmark card ever be a big seller that says this, whatever the occasion. I love you, Pastor John, with half of my heart. I love you, honey, on our 25th anniversary with half of my heart. So you're half-hearted for me. Amen. Yes, I am, 50%. I'm almost majority in, honey. I mean, it's silly, and you're smiling, but what, what is it we give God? And the, the, the answer is, what does God say we give? What does God see? He watches us. He listens to us. He sees where we spend our time. He, spend, he sees what we do with our talents and he sees what we do with our treasures. God knows. 
I'll tell you who else knows. When your kids are junior high, ask them what they think is the most important thing to you because they don't have enough sense not to, t- to tell you what you want to hear. It can be very convicting. Loving obedience. Listen well. Let's listen well. Let's be careful. Being careful is not being legalistic. Being obedient is not being legalistic. Legalism is adding to the word. Do what the word says. Be careful to do what the word says. Do exactly what the word says and do it with love. Love God in your obedience. That's a hard part of obedience sometimes. We don't want to lose that. You don't want to lose heart for this. Look at the next verse. I call this the Lord's placement, or it could be position would, would work as well. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. I want them inside of you. What I'm commanding you need to be internal convictions. Something you believe from the inside. Something you believe from the innermost part of you. Something that you believe from that which makes you who you are. Love it and have it in your heart. God is not confusing. This is not complicated. It's not easy. But it's what God's called us to do. Let's keep reading. There's a lot to go. The Lord's plan and his precepts. Seven through nine. He starts unpacking the parent plan. You shall teach them diligently. If you write in your Bible or highlight, I would highlight the word diligently. Teach them diligently to your children. And and talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. Be diligent. Many of you have heard Proverbs 22, 6 over and over in your lifetime, maybe from your grandparents, your parents, and on, but you, you'll, most of you will know this verse. Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go. Train. What does train mean? I've actually had a, a, a couple of very tough conversations with parents I've gotten to know over time. I've gotten to know them, and, and I've had tough conversations because they Came, there came a point in their life where they would drop their children off for church and go home and they'd come back and pick them up. And that's not the norm, but I, I, I was just trying, I just like, I just don't know what to do. I can't do nothing here. So I have to talk to them. I said, you know, you're training them that their, their faith life is, is, has a uh, ending point. You need God when you're little. You just don't need, need him when you're, bigger. You don't need him when you're older. That's not training. And to a great extent, the church has bailed the the parents out on discipleship. And Mark has a very tough job. Mark's been here. Mark Shaddix hasn't been here very long, but he's got a very, very tough job because his job is to come alongside parents and help them disciple their kids. And if they resist that, then there's a chance they're going to be mad at him. But, but he and the rest of the staff, we want to equip you so that you don't miss out on the purposes, the blessings, and the privileges of being a parent. Ephesians 6, 1 and 2 is an, an also a familiar verse that I wanted to share with you today. And ironically, Paul opens up with the word children. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Honor your mother and your father. So it's ironic that he opens up with children because it's not children who are responsible to honor and obey. It's parents that are responsible to teach them to do that. By the time you get to Ephesians 6, Paul is really unwrapping all the great uh, doctrine of the family and the home and work and marriage. Marriage, chapter 5 and chapter 6, he's really ramping up the home in Ephesians 5 and 6. And work. I mean, these are all the places where we live. And ironically, right after all of that, we have the most intensive section of spiritual warfare found in all the New Testament, not counting Revelation. Do this in your home, do this in your work, do this with your children, because you're gonna be under attack like never before, and the greatest attack is going to be, has been, and will be our home. No doubt in my mind. Psalm 119.11 says, Thy word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Get the word of God in your children's minds and through their ears and hopefully one day 
it'll make it to their heart. What does it mean when Moses says, when you sit, when you walk, when you lie down, when you rise up? I think it's a real simple way of saying, make every moment a God moment. Make every moment a God moment. Every time you sit down to eat, that's a God moment. God provided that for you. So I've got so much food in my pantry. Lose your job, lose your health, health that food's going to be gone in a blink. In a blink, right? Things can be lost so fast. Every moment is to be a God moment. I was with my youngest son not long ago up in Alaska, and we were driving in the mountains behind, the Chugach Mountains behind the city of Anchorage are just majestic. They're wonderful. They're beautiful in the daytime, but at that dusk, at dusk and dawn, they have this incredible silhouette. And my oldest two, I would say to them as I used to drive them uh, to, to school, which was at the church, I'd say, look at those mountains, guys. And finally, they'd say, Dad, we know, we know, we know God made the mountains. We know, Dad, we know. We've heard it, Dad. And they, they were being funny. But I just couldn't help myself that they were out there. And Zeb, my youngest, who's in the back here today, he, he, was, he brought it up. Dad, look at the mountains. Aren't they awesome? They are. When you sit down, make sure you teach your kids that God is interested in being a part of their life when they're sitting, walking, lying down, or rising up. And if we don't do that, they're going to create a generation who, who believes that God wakes up on Sunday and goes to sleep the rest of the week, that he's just a non-existent part of their life. Do you know anybody that is different on Sunday than they are the rest of the week? I know a bunch of people as pastor. I know a bunch of people that way. And the goal is to be, God, be God-centered day in and day out all week long. Look at the seventh one. This is the longest one, the Lord's providence and his grace. And there's no nation outside of Israel that has been blessed by God more than the United States of America, in my opinion. And so the application is strong uh, for me today. As you hear these words, you were born or you, have, or you are now living in the greatest nation under heaven. And things have been done here that, that, you, that we enjoy that we didn't do. We didn't establish. Somebody else did that for us. Look at verses 10 through 25. Well, let me finish that, the other section. I stopped at verse 8. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes, you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Now, the religious Jews, even today, when you see them at the wall, they'll have what's called phylacteries. A phylactery is a little, little leather box with long leather strings coming off of them. And they will put scripture, little scripture, cut scripture inside that box. And it'll be right here by their heart and they'll wrap it. You might see them wrapping this around their arm. It's part of their preparation before they pray, before they do what they do. And then they'll put it on their head, little leather box, and they'll wrap it around their head. They're following Deuteronomy 6, sort of. Because God didn't say put it near your heart, outside your head. He said he wants it inside your heart. But that's what they're doing based on this passage of Scripture. One of the things that I believe is very, very important is that you ought to put Scripture up in your house. And I, 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 love, I love seeing scripture in the house. of We have scripture all over the place. It's good for us to see truth. It's good for us to be exposed to it over and over and over again. And I, I, I stole this from my father, but it, he says, if you really want to be reminded of something, put a notice on the refrigerator and your uh, bathroom mirror. You'll see it every day. We always look in the mirror and we always go to the fridge. Put the word up. Get it in your heart, but put it up. Expose your family. Expose yourself to these truths. Verse 10, and when the Lord your God. And here we go. There's going to be a little bit of a, of a uh, uh, not documentary, but l- listen to the dialogue of, of Moses. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you. God's keeping his promise. That's why you're going in. You will have great and good cities that you did not build. 
you will have houses full of good things that you did not fill. Cisterns, wells that you did not dig. Vineyards and olive trees, they'll already be there. You didn't plant them. And when you eat and are full, then take care lest you forget the Lord. We just talked about this last week in the commitment of communion. Don't forget the Lord. They didn't have to grow. They didn't have to plant. They didn't have to dig. They didn't have to build the sin of the Amorites, the sin of those people. God has punished them. He's moving them out, moving his people in. He has every right to do that. And they are blessed by having all these things instantly. Sort of like us. One of Satan's lie to me growing up in the broken home that I grew up in. I didn't know the Lord and I didn't even know who Satan was, but he lied to me. He was very powerful in my sphere. But looking back, he lied to me. I was convinced that I was the only kid in my town that was living in a broken home that had the kind of violence and the kind of anger and the kind of just chaos that happened day in and day out. I thought I was just me. And it made it worse. It was already painful. It was already embarrassing. But now it's isolating. And unfortunately, I have found out over the years that what happened in my home is the new norm. That if you grew up in a loving, calm family, um, you are rare indeed. And the church can change that. And the church has to change that. It's part of part of God's calling to us. Isn't this amazing? All this is true, but don't forget the Lord. You didn't do it. The go- I can tell you this. I don't care if it's, I'll, I'll pick on Republicans and Democrats because they both say stupid things all the time. The answer to any nation is God. God provides. It's not what the government provides. It's what God, it's what God provides. Governments couldn't provide it if God didn't provide it. Every good thing comes from God. Now look look what he says. What don't you want us to forget, Lord? Verse 12. Take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Remember that? 400 years of slavery. Verse 13. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve and by his name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the people who are around you. For the Lord your God is in the midst, uh, in your midst is a jealous God, which shows that jealousy is not always sinful or God would be a sinner. God is jealous for us. We belong to him. He made a vow to us and we made a vow to him. Lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you and destroy you from the face of the earth. Strong language as they go in to the promised land. You shall not Put the Lord your God to the test as you did to him in Massa 40 years ago. You shall diligently keep the commandments. Second time the word diligently is used of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes, which he has commanded you. And you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord. In his sight, he decides what's right and good. That it may go well with you and that you may go in and take possession of the good land that the Lord, sw- the Lord swore to give your fathers by thrusting out all your enemies from before you as the Lord has promised. And he anticipates our children having questions. Verse 20, when your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that the Lord our God has commanded you? What does this mean? Then you shall say to your son, I mean, God can't make it any easier, folks. We were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders, great and grievous, against Egypt and against Pharaoh and against all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from here that he might bring us in and give us the land that he swore to give our, to our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as we are this day. And it will be righteousness for us. What a statement. It will be right, right, upright, righteousness, incredible blessing for us if we are careful to do all this commandment. 
before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. Now, I'm almost done here. I'm almost done here. But I have to say something. Moses, Moses never mentions himself. Never. What he did. It wasn't false humility. But Moses, God didn't get, get Moses squared away with him so that he might make a name for Moses. Moses was important, but Moses didn't do this. God did this. And what's important, whether it's in Israel, the promised land, or Lenore City, is that we make sure we, we give God the due that he deserves. That God's name be great. That God's glory be great. That it's not about your favorite pastor, your favorite ministry, any of that stuff. That God did this. God is doing something in our midst. I'm going to take you to Judges chapter 2 in, in conclusion. And I'm going to give you some bad news. Israel did not obey Deuteronomy 6. This is Joshua, um, excuse me, Judges chapter 2, 6 through 10. Let me read this and close. And it speaks of the death of Joshua. And I want you to hear this very clearly. When Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel went each to his inheritance to take possession of the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. And they buried him within the boundaries of his inheritance in timnath Perez, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gaash. Here it is. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. One generation. One generation. To turn things around or to let things go. And we've got to be the generation to turn it around. Let's pray. Father, today, more than maybe any other day, I want to speak encouragement. I, want, I ask you, Lord, to pour encouragement into our parents, into the moms and dads, the grandmas and grandpas, the aunts and the uncles, that there might be a renewed commitment to family that that you have used the COVID-19 virus to renew the place of the family in our lives. That you might be rebuilding, reprioritizing the family, reconnecting the family as only you can. Lord, help us to be jealous in the same way that you have been to protect and preserve and not get too busy not fall back into the rat race of this world. And that family extends to the church family, the family of faith. Lord, I, I pray today that whether we stand up, sit down, rise up, or go on the way, that we would have thoughts of you, that we would continue to, to think of you, pray to you, and read your word. And we'd be so filled with you that when life squeezes us, you would come out of us. Thank you for the word of God, for the beginning of a series. It's vital to every Christian, every church, vital that we have a heartbeat for your word. Lord, may there be a renewed commitment today to read carefully, to listen, to hear, to read, and to obey your word. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Just as I am, just.
I pray that you step out and go with God in all that you do this week and continue to pray with us for the time we can gather again face to face. Later this afternoon, be looking for an email and the link to be posted where you can begin to vote for senior pastor. You'll have two weeks to do so. I encourage you to do so. If you don't have electronic access or know folks that do not, tell them they can call the church office during office hours. That's Monday through Thursday, 9 o'clock to 2 o'clock. But let's leave with this blessing from Romans chapter 15. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Go with God and we'll gather together soon.